Uh, thanks for coming this afternoon. Um, it's good to see so many people here. Um, to start off with, I'd like to introduce my colleague. Uh, this is Sanjay Dutt. He's a uh, team leader at Christchurch City Council. He looks after the building consent processing team. And hopefully, uh, if there's an issue you have that I'm unable to answer, uh, hopefully Sanjay will be able to put some light on it for you. OK, thanks a lot. Um, so uh, my name's Gary Hyam. I'm an advisor with the Consent System Capability Team of the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. And uh, I'm based in Wellington. Um, I have the dubious task of being sent down here today to do the seminar. Just briefly, my background. Uh, for my sins, I was an architect for 20 odd years, and then seven and a half years with Wellington City Council as a building consenting officer. And then I've been with the what was the Department of Building and Housing for five years, um, but we are now the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. Uh, I work for the Consent System Capability Team. We're a small team of eight. Basically, um, ex-builders, ex-architects, ex-plumbers, and we have a Bachelor of Building Science graduate in our group. And most of us have had uh, experience with working with councils, uh, doing the building consenting role. Um, just broadly, um, some of the functions that our team do, uh, we monitor, review and improve the performance of councils, hopefully. We manage and strengthen relationships with councils and other building sector stakeholders, such as these sort of forums today. And we provide advice and publish guidance for the sector, and if you have a complaint about a council, we will investigate it if need be. Just a quick word about MB. Um, <laughs> we've been in existence now since the 1st of July 2012. Basically, it's uh, the integration of four uh, government agencies that was the Ministry of Economic Development, Ministry of Science and Innovation, the Department of Labour and the Department of Building and Housing. <laughs> MB's purpose is to grow New Zealand for all. Because of its contribution to New Zealand's economy, the building and construction sector is one of the key areas that MB is involved in. I have to stress that MB is not responsible for inspecting individual buildings, but for the regulatory regime, all laws that govern the building and construction sector. MB is the key agency that is responding to the Canterbury Earthquake Royal Commission recommendations has the lead on 177 of the 189 recommendations in that report. So that's my intro over. <laughs> um, just before we kick off, uh, I wouldn't mind a uh, quick straw poll of, to gauge the makeup of the audience. So if you could just uh, Quick show of hands, uh, if you're a, an architect or an architectural designer, can you put up your hands? No? Okay. Any engineers in the audience? No. Any builders or tradespeople in the building sector? Oh yeah, we've got a few. And the rest of you presumably are homeowners that have earthquake damaged homes, is that correct? Okay. Thought that might be the case. So, homeowners' rights and responsibilities. So, 
Regardless of whether building consent is required or not, all new building work must comply with the building code. And section 17 of the Building Act 2004 um, states that, and your contractors who are working on your behalf should be aware of that. I've got to stress right from the outset that um, to make the whole process smoother, we recommend as a ministry that you engage at a very, very early stage with the interested stakeholders in your rebuild or repair. So we're talking about people like EQC, your insurance company, the council, Christchurch City Council, if you're in their area, or Waimakariri or Selwyn District Council, and also your, uh, your mortgage brokers or banks. If you do that earlier on, um, everybody hopefully singing from the same song sheet and the process should go smoother. Right, the building code. Um, New Zealand has a performance-based building code and it sets the minimum national building standards but there are slight variations from region to region within New Zealand. So for argument's sake, you might be in a, an area where you have particularly high snowfalls, so you, you need to take account of the snow loadings when you do your roof design, for argument's sake, in some areas. Whereas in uh, Auckland, where snow is particularly unlikely, or North Auckland, uh, that's not a consideration. So des designers, builders, your project management office are responsible for making sure that the work complies with the building code. The building work is covered by implied warranties which are set out in the, the Building Act. And if you believe those warranties have been breached, then you can take the tradesperson, the PMO, or the contractor to court. If you think the work is faulty, don't ignore it. Discuss it with the person doing the work or the lead contractor. And hopefully they will rectify it, otherwise you might need to take further steps. Technically it's the homeowner at the end of the day who carries the legal obligation, but you would hope that the professionals that you've got engaged will do a proper professional job. Once you have a building consent, um, I would advocate that you try to get your code compliance certificate as soon as possible after the work is completed. This is council signing off saying that the work does comply with the building consent that was approved and it also complies with the building code. That's why we have building inspectors on site because there could be, from time to time, human error and the processing officer might have overseen, overlooked something and it's actually picked up by the inspector on site who then sort of takes the necessary steps for it to be rectified and comply with the building code. Um, I have to say my experience of working at Wellington City Council all too often I've seen people when it comes to, when they come to selling their property, uh, they really regret the fact that they haven't organised getting a code compliance certificate when building work has been undertaken. And often there's been a sale that's fallen through on the basis that the code compliance certificate wasn't actually issued by the council. So I really encourage you to get that CCC as soon as possible when the building work's finished. Build it right. Whoops. So work that is critical to the structure of the building or its weather tightness is known as restricted building work. Now restricted building work only came into being uh, 1st of March last year, and hopefully 
most of you have been aware of the, the television campaign that was on at the time, uh, Build It Right, uh, the little cartoon figure that sort of appeared on your screen every so often. It only covers homes and small to medium sized apartment complexes. It doesn't cover commercial or building work, you know, commercial or industrial building work. So if, if the work is restricted building work, then it must be done by or supervised by a licensed building practitioner. <coughs> PMOs are bound by the law. They must ensure that restricted building work is done on your home is supervised or carried out by an LB, LBP. On the department, oh, sorry, old habits die hard. Um, the, on the ministry's website, uh, there is a register of licensed building practitioners that the public can access. Uh, currently, there's 22,750 people who've applied for. 30,000 licences. And there's a whole series of licence classes. There's seven classes. Um, I'll just go through those quickly. Uh, roofers, uh, brick and block layers, foundation specialists, external plasterers, architectural designers, site managers, and carpentry. Now, if you're a chartered professional engineer or a registered architect, you, you are already deemed to be a licensed building practitioner. So you should be acting in a very professional way. So what's happened to building standards since the earthquake in September 2010 and then again in February 2011? Um, there are now stronger foundations and more resilient buildings now required in the Camp Canterbury region. Um, hopefully you're all aware that you're now required to provide ductile, that's non-brittle, mesh and concrete floor slabs. And this mesh is to be tied into the reinforcing rods in the, in the perimeter foundation footings. Uh, it was something that was done uh, around most of the country. I must admit it came as a surprise to me when I came down here for Operation Suburb and looked at 500 houses to see how many slabs were actually broken. But um, we were quite surprised that these weren't actually reinforced at that time. MB has published technical guidance and um, some of you might have seen it. Um, it's this document here. Um, it's really designed for engineers, architects, um, PMOs. It's not really for the homeowner. Um, but if you're really interested, you can access this on our website and you can download it freely. It does provide a whole series of options um, for foundation rebuilds and foundation repairs. And it covers all the green zone technical categories, so TC1, 2 and 3. And as part of our role, we've been doing presentations to various interested parties about this guidance document. Uh, we started about August last year. Initially, we, we presented to several groups of uh, building control officers, both inspectors and consenting officers from the three Canterbury uh, councils. Uh, and then we followed that up with the PMOs, We've done presentations also to architects and designers. And most recently, we've done uh, engineers as well. Shortly, uh, we're going to be doing presentations to builders. And I'm not sure whether we are going to do presentations to uh, the general public. I'm not sure at this point in time. But there is some, a couple of documents that you can refer to. 
that are available on our site um, and also available um, at our stall. I think there's copies of this on your seats, hopefully. Uh, I would really recommend it. This is written for building owners. Um, it's a good step-by-step -step process to follow. And I thoroughly recommend that you get a copy of this, either from here or from our stand. There's also a couple of other documents, but these are strictly, well, these are basically been written for builders in mind. So above floor work, a guide for Canterbury builders, and another one below floor work, again for builders. But you might be interested in looking at that. Um, I mean, it pays to get some background information so you can ask the right sort of questions to those people that are doing the work for you. So rebuilding in areas that are susceptible to liquefaction. So this is typically your uh, TC2, TC, sorry, TC2 and particularly your TC3 uh, sites in the green zone. Uh, MB's guidance recommends we really advocate that you try as much as possible to go to lightweight materials, especially for your uh, wall claddings and your roof claddings. Um, it does make quite a considerable difference to your uh, design of your foundation if you can reduce that weight that's bearing on the ground. Um, lighter coverings include such things as weatherboards made of timber, fibre cement, PVC or aluminium. Some of these have uh, lower maintenance than those which require painting and some timber cladding can be left uncoated requiring less maintenance which I know as people get older and I'm one of them, uh, you don't particularly want to have a, uh, uh, a maintenance uh, issue that you have to deal with on a regular basis. So there are materials available. Um, I recommend that you look around at some of the commercial stalls. They have some options there that you might wish to consider in your rebuild. Just a quick mention about the Simple House Acceptable Solution. This became effective on uh, 31st of March 2010. It's uh, this document here which is available on our website again. Um, basically this guide was put together to make new houses um, an attainable goal for first home buyers. Basically it's a 200 page cookbook for house design and if you follow this, you are deemed to comply with the, the building code. And the council, if you follow this to the letter, then uh, will have no choice but to accept your building consent application. However, there are things that are not covered by this. You know, the site-specific stuff, you know, like your connections to uh, the pl plumbing and uh, your network op operators, network utility operators. Uh, and things such as site works, you know, you're a, if you have retaining walls on your site, um, that's outside the scope of this and uh, that will need to be covered with your building consent application. There are limits on um, the scope of that acceptable solution. For example, the house is limited to single storey, detached household unit and wind zones up to 50 metres per second and there's a maximum length and width of floor of 24 metres, including any attached garage. And there's a whole lot of other limitations on it, so you need to read it uh, quite closely to see whether your design actually fits within that, with those parameters. So, just a few tips, and it's covered in that uh, booklet I showed you. Oops. Um, a lot of what I'm saying is actually in this document, so again I stress that you read it. 
Uh, as an architect, uh, I got in the habit, um, and I think um, I would encourage everybody to do it as well, that uh, whenever you give instructions in relating to building work or to your contractor or whatever, or even if you're talking to um, various interested parties, you know, EQC or your insurer, council, whatever, make a note of it um, and follow up your phone call, put it in writing, confirm it in writing. It's amazing how many times when issues come up downstream that you need to refer to those notes. So I uh, encourage you to do that. Particularly if you're going to vary the work on site and invariably when building work is undertaken, uh, for one reason or another there will be changes. You know, uh, The builder comes across a problem that he didn't expect to come across. He might need to vary the design. Um, the owner might decide to have a, a change as well. I don't particularly like the way that's been designed. Let's go this way. So confirm it in writing. Keep all receipts, invoices, manufacturer's warranties. And if there's any uh, issues with um, warranties, make sure you, you follow them up quickly before, uh, um, you know, before the old memory fades. And my final slide, which is different from what I've got in front of me. <laughs> Um, so if you need somewhere to stay, there's the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service. Um, some of you might be aware that um, the Ministry, in conjunction with other government agencies, have actually set up four temporary villages, uh, three of them in existence at the moment. So that's uh, Limwood. Uh, <laughs> Oh, sorry, Kaupoi and Rafiti uh, Domain. Rangers Park is uh, under construction at the moment and they've been designed basically in mind that as people need to shift out of their houses to, in order to let the contractors do their building work, uh, you can for a short period of time, perhaps three to six months, shift out into the temporary village and let the building contractors get on with the work uh, free of uh, having to work around occupants. They also provide financial assistance for temporary accommodation costs and they also um, can liaise with other organisations that might be able to assist you with your accommodation needs. So if you need more information, um, CTAS, uh, the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service, is the, uh, that top number there. If you've got any information at all, um, you can look at our website there, mb.govt.nz, of course with the www in front. <laughs> and also you can uh, get in contact with Sanjay and his friends at uh, Christchurch City Council. Um, Thanks for coming. Uh, I think we've got opportunity for some questions. Uh, we've got a roving mic, so um, yeah, far away. And hopefully, uh, if I have difficulty, Sanjay will help me out. Thanks. Yeah, I just got a question on uh, foundation questions. Uh, you said earlier that um, under that build it right uh, segment about structure and weather tightness, it must be done by a licensed builder, and it's now required a type of foundation that uh, must be attached and tied in and reinforced to the existing foundation. So I'm talking about a foundation that has to be ripped out of your house or part of your house, relayed, and then tied into the existing foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I thought I heard you say it has to be tied into the reinforced steel that's in your existing foundation? Well, that's assuming you have steel there in the first place, but certainly if you're building from scratch, right, we'd expect to see, well, th there's been cases where houses have been jacked up and then a new concrete slab's been built below the jacked up house. 
Now, you would expect uh, to, to follow the, uh, the new um, acceptable solutions that you would need to provide mesh in the, and it's got to be ductile mesh within the slab, and the foundation perimeter footings would need to have reinforcing rods in, and you would need to tie that in to the mesh. Now, where you've got an existing situation where a, a corner of a house is broken away, and there's no reinforcing steel at all in the existing foundation walls, then all you can do is basically drill into the existing um, concrete foundations and epoxy resin rods, and then the new part that's been replaced will, you know, be fully reinforced. Okay. So, you know. Yeah, so that's good though. It's just specifically about the attachment right. of the new slab within yep. the dwelling. Yeah. Because um, it's not the. I'm not going to be a case where my whole no, house is lifted no, up. It'll be no. six and of the house being ripped out yep. and replaced. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> you mentioned about compliance. Uh, my question is. Um, do they make progress checks? And if so, who's responsible? OK, so presumably you've got a building consent for this? Not yet. We're um, in the early stage. We've, we've yeah. um, selected a builder. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I might give this to Sanjay, but I do know the answer, but I'll see what Sanjay has to say. Uh, Hi, yes. Uh, once you apply for a building consent, your building consent gets granted, and you start working on your building. Uh, there will be inspections carried out on your site, and we will list what type of inspection and when we will come to do the inspection, so it will be followed up. Thank you. Just wait for the mic, please. Our property is in a TC3 zoned area and we've had two engineers come out um, just recently and inspected our property and uh, the land was primarily uh, fairly badly damaged but he did say that they went underneath the manhole and had a look underneath the, um, the floorboards mm -hmm. and he did say that the foundations on our property were exceptionally good. Now in the TC3 zoning they're uh, stating that any reconstruction has got to be checked with the foundations and some houses have to be lifted, etc., to um, maintain or repair the foundations. Now, he had a look at ours and he said the foundations are the best he's ever seen. Mm -hmm. And in TC3 zone land, um, if this was the case and the uh, foundations didn't, didn't have to be repaired, mm -hmm. um, would the house have to be lifted? I don't think it would. Now, I'll carry on, because he did say that um, with, with the uh, property there, the foundations, um, he thought they would be OK as is. And they're uh, stating that it was going to be 2015 before we got a repair on our property. And I'm telling them that if it was under that and they only had to reclad the property, which is what it needs to be done, and possibly a linear board material which is lighter than the existing Summerhill stone block. Right. Um, and it would, would that be done in a quicker time? And he thought that that would be the case. Would that be so? So my understanding is if the foundations are fine and you're in a TC3 zone and you've just got superstructure damage, yep. then you can go ahead and do it and... Uh, you know, there is, um, in our guidance, um, I'm, I believe that's covered. Um, so, you know, yeah. you won't get a bigger event than what you've already had. So the foundations have proved themselves to, to have done the job properly, so. Okay, that, no, that's fine. Yeah. Um, the, the other continuation <laughs> of that is that I've been in, 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 excuse me, in discussion with the council and with the TC3 zone stigma, which everybody in TC3 zone has got that. Now, if, if you come to selling your existing property, people say, oh, TC3 zone, no, steer clear of that. But they're saying that um, possibly if repairs and everything else are done, 
the TC3 stigma would possibly be lifted. Would that be the case? Well, it's easy T for TC3, me. TC3, everybody, they've zoned your TC3 and men. That's like uh, pleurisy. God, we don't want to go anywhere near that. Well, the thing is, um, I come from Wellington, right? Um, I have no idea what zone my site, well, my, my ha house is built on, right? Mm. TC3 you, is, you, is the you, worst zone. You know for a fact, because um, this city must be the most um, investigated city in terms of subsoil conditions in the world. On the planet, yep. Yep. So, and you're... Your building has, you know, survived a really yeah. big event. Re really well, yep. Yep. Uh, you're not but, in the but, red zone. No, but the land, the land is damaged. Though, yeah, right? but, you know, um, I would think it's reassuring to anybody selling a property like that that you've had no damage. So, you know, I, no. I have no idea how my house in Wellington or anybody else in Wellington Which has got any, any idea how it will respond in, a, in a, an equivalent event in Wellington. Mm. But perhaps it can help. The council at the previous meeting we went to did say that eventually the TC3 stigma would be lifted. Would that be the case? I'm not sure if the uh, categorisation of TC1, TC2 or TC3 will be ever lifted. It's just, um, it came about um, you know, dealing with the amount of damages we were initially going to deal with. And so uh, DBH or MB had decided at that time that, you know, if we categorize this land into TC1, 2 and 3, and we'll have professionals to deal with in that, otherwise we wouldn't have number of people dealing with where you need them to deal with. And so now TC3 has been misrepresented in one way. It doesn't mean that you'll, uh, you know, in any worse situation than anyone else. It just means you need more investigation on your land to make sure you get uh, proper building done as a person on TC1 or TC2. So well, I, I, think it's been, I think it's been totally misrepresented. <laughs> yeah. you, you've only got to look at the um, Saturday morning's press and there was a piece on the front page there, TC3 people are sick and, sick and tired of the, of the situation that yeah. they're in. Yeah. Sim simply because if you come to sell your property, um, the valuation on your property has dropped 50% yeah. straight away, yeah. whether, whether it be in good condition or not. If it's in TC3 stigma, you're stuck with a 50% loss yeah. in value, and, which, is, and, which yeah. on the council seen as total burglary. Yeah, and that was never the intention. It was to dedicate more professional into TC3 than you'll need them in TC1. Otherwise, we'll ask everyone to get geotechnical investigation done, and you will never get around to do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, we have a house out on the uh, Parklands area and we have a concrete slab which we reinforced. The whole slab has not one crack that we can see. There was a very, very fine one f prior to the earthquakes, but the actual pad is not cracked at all, and the, except that it has shifted. The whole house has basically shifted. But at the last symposium here via uh, IAG, the Hawkins said to us, I was quite interested to know what they're going to do about this concrete tile roof, which apparently weighs many tonnes. He said, oh, we'll just jack it up and the tile roof on it and then lower it down again. So now I'm hearing that they're going to be lightening the cladding and roof. Is that the case now? They're going to be looking at the weight of the uh, materials. I guess it depends on the extent of the damage and yeah. the extent of the rebuild. Um, certainly if you're starting from scratch, you should, you know... Try a different yeah. cladding here. Yeah. It was pretty hard to un get to grips with this uh, when you know how heavy concrete tiles are. They're very heavy, so uh, mm. it certainly uh, is food for thought to think you're going to jack a whole house up with a complete tile roof on a concrete tile roof. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we've got time for one more question, apparently. Hello. Um, our place is on the hill. It's uh, weatherboard construction with steel roof. Uh, subject to severe vertical uplift 
and then severe racking. Uh, our concern is that being one of only three houses at the end of the uh, of 20 at the end of the street that remains, the rest are all going. That the bracing in the walls is severely damaged. Uh, my concern is that the insurance company and builders will take off the cracked jib and simply replace it. Is there any guarantee that the insurance company has to pay for rebracing of the wall, the interior wall bracing, um, or put strengthening ply before reapplying jib? I don't know what your contract's like with your insurer, so at, at this, yeah, hang on, Sanjay's got something to say. I can comment from the building uh, concerned or building code point of view. Um, what the code requires uh, for existing building, if they're doing a repair work, you can't, after the alterations taken place, you can't make it worse than it was before. So it's a, on a, for a building on its entirety, if the bracing was, for example, um, 100 bracing units, after the repair, it can't be less than 100 bracing units. So they are not obliged, if I would uh, get it right, to upgrade it pro from a building concern point of view to make it to 120 uh, bracing units. From the building concern point of view, if they do it to 100, we have to grant a building concern. Okay, uh, you know, my concern is that e every one of the, you know, where the joists and the dwangs and things go together and they're nailed together, yeah. that every one of those, the engineers tell me, will be weakened. Uh, so that simply putting jib back on will not, you know, give me a safe home. So that's, that's my concern. So your advice really is that I need to look carefully at the insurance policy. Yes. And talk to the insurance people about what, in fact, they will do. Yes. Unfortunately, and, and we if they won't yeah. do what I want, what do I do then? <laughs> Don't pay the premium. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, enjoy the rest of the expo. See ya. Bye.